For too long, America's development policies have been narrowly focused on aid. But remember, development does not equal aid. Aid is important, but in this interconnected and interdependent world, U.S. development policies must go beyond aid to include policies on trade, migration, investment, climate, security, technology transfer, all of the policies that affect the way the rules of the game in a global system actually work. That's why for most of the last year, we've been working on a whole raft of practical, concrete proposals across a wide range of policy areas that are, as it turns out, surprisingly low cost or even zero cost for American taxpayers. Now, we are delighted to present to you the White House and the World, practical proposals on global development for the next U.S. President. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Rajesh Merchandani. I'm the Senior Director of Communication and Policy Outreach here at the Center for Global Development, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon. I'm going to be the host for today's panel discussion, Global Development and the 2016 Election, also known as Why Global Development Matters for the Next U.S. President and What He or She Should Do About It. It's an increasingly important discussion as we head into the campaigns proper, and it also marks the launch of this meaty piece of work. You've all got one on your chair. If you're watching us on the live webcast, welcome. Check a look at the dedicated uh, website, cgdev.org. You can access it via our homepage. It is packed full of practical ideas aimed squarely at the campaigns and the next president. We'll tell you more about it shortly. But first, let me tell you a little bit about our panel. They have huge depth of experience and knowledge on US policies and how they impact people overseas. Let me invite them to the stage as I introduce them. In fact, gentlemen, if you'd like to take your seats up on stage. So first of all, we have Ben Leo, CGD Senior Fellow and co-editor of the White House and the World Project. The eagle-eyed amongst you will notice he's not Nancy Birdsell, although frankly, I've never seen them together. <laughs> uh, Nancy's plane was delayed and she was, she's hot-footing it here from the airport. She may join us later. Ben, however, has lived and breathed this project and the issues behind it. Next to Ben, Tom Nides was Deputy Secretary of State under President Obama until 2013. Then he took up the role of Vice Chairman at Morgan Stanley. Previously, he held high-level offices with several major public and private financial institutions. Next to Tom. Michael Elliott tore up the world of journalism as editor of Time magazine and Newsweek, now runs riot through the status quo of development as president and CEO of the One campaign. In fact, he just came back from Addis Ababa, where, I, where we saw each other at the UN Financing for Development conference, and there, the One campaign extracted commitments from, among others, the US government to create more and better data for development. And at the end of the line, no means least, Tony Fratto, served as Deputy Assistant and Deputy Press Secretary to President George W. Bush, representing the administration on international and domestic economic policy. Before that, he served as Assistant Secretary at the U.S. Treasury. He now runs Hamilton Place Strategies, a consultancy here in D.C. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, if anybody knows how, about how U.S. policies can impact development, our panel does. And I'd like to invite you to give them a round of applause to welcome them. Good. Panel, thank you. As I said, Nancy is hot-footing it. Forgive us for the horrendously all-male panel. It wasn't deliberate, I promise you. <laughs> no letters of complaint, please. And, and one Nancy equals three of us. As <laughs> apparently there, yeah, there are many ways of saying that. Um, now, what we're going to do, we're going to hear from each of the panelists throughout uh, this afternoon uh, before we open it up to questions. I am very keen to get to questions. And panelists, if you have been to an event here that I've moderated, you'll know that I am rather ruthless when it comes to timekeeping. So I will ask you to move along with your comments without cutting you too short. We want to get to some of the substance of the issues as well. So panel, audience, the reality of development is shifting, has shifted, the need is different. Aid is a tiny and declining proportion of development finance. And the US, 
Long the shining city on the hill is losing some of its luster. Yet more than ever, development policy is vital to America's relationship with the world. So, given that, what should the next US president do to ensure and enrich America's future position as a power and a partner to the developing world? Let's get some thoughts on this issue. Ben Leo, we'll go to you first of all. Co-author of the White House and the World Project. Give us the big picture view, Ben, that led you and Nancy to this project. Why is White House and the World needed? What are the issues that make it necessary? And hint a little, lift the cover a bit about what people might find inside. I'll try my best on that. Um, Rajesh, your, your lead-in actually was perfect in terms of some major drivers that have been underway over the last 10 or 20 years. And what does that mean for the US in terms of its foreign policy development, commercial policies abroad, in the context of prosperity and stability at home, as well as projecting our influence and outcomes abroad. I've, I'd like to start with a couple of, of examples of these, these drivers, these dynamics that have dramatically changed how we should engage things that have happened over the last 10, 10 or 20 years. First, I would start off with um, uh, how increasingly multipolar the world is. So Rajesh mentioned that the US is, is, has lost a little bit of its shine or sheen. Uh, I mean, we, we all know about how China and other emerging actors are dramatically increasing their engagement throughout the world, giving uh, smaller nations, a lot of other options in terms of financing and commercial partnerships has dramatic implications for, for America. Second is how private investment and remittance flows now dramatically dwarf foreign aid, um, uh, which again uh, has significant implications. This is particularly the case when you compare that contrast to 50 or 60 years ago when USAID was originally established. Third is how domestic resources within developing countries have increased exponentially. Uh, if you think of Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa alone, it's increased fourfold the domestic tax revenues since 2000. That means there's a lot more resources within these countries to address development objectives. Uh, and then lastly, I think we're going to hear a little bit more about this, is the U.S. economy and the workforce are increasingly dependent upon developing country markets. If you look at exports to developing countries, it's about $600 billion a year now, which is larger than Europe, Japan, and Europe combined. So the poor countries of 20, 30 years ago are now major markets. We need to be thinking about who the next major markets are. Despite these very significant changes in trends, the U.S. government's approach to development policies has, as the, the video alluded to, remained largely focused on foreign aid as the key driver for global prosperity and stability um, and, uh, and facilitating or supporting more democratic and stable countries. Um, we need to significantly expand the emphasis on a range of tools. And that's what this White House in the World project is all about in terms of harnessing America's greatest strengths, $17 trillion economy, strong, strong history of entrepreneurship, deep capital markets, innovation, relatively open trade and investment policies. Harnessing all of those strengths in a comprehensive uh, and, and thoughtful way uh, that promotes our objectives both abroad and at home. So some things that are in there, trade, investment, migration, energy policies, uh, global health, there's a broad category within here as well as a series of reforms that would make US development institutions and policies and programs fit for purpose in this ever-changing environment that we find ourselves in. Ben Leo, thank you very much indeed. So, developing countries, what do they need? They don't need aid, they need jobs, they need opportunities. Tom Nides, that has foreign policy implications. You've spent decades in the foreign policy world and in the private sector. What is the foreign policy case 
for a robust U.S. development apparatus and the business case. If you could talk about that for a couple of minutes, Tom, would be grateful. Well, first of all, if you lose your job in your current job, you could be a commentator of some sort. You're really good at this. You got the whole. <laughs> That's why I lost the last. You got the job. whole shtick <laughs> going back and forth. Uh, let me uh, let me make a couple uh, points. First of all, the work you all do here, um, Nancy and I had a very strong working relationship, and when we were trying to not only defend our budget but trying to emphasize a need for additional resources, you guys were always at the forefront. So I certainly, from a policy perspective, I appreciate the work you've done here because it's it's intellectually based. It's 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 got real substance behind it, and it's enormously effective. So thank you for all the work you all have done. Uh, listen, from my perspective, and I have got, interesting. I've got some of my former colleagues from the State Department here and a lot of people who know way more about this than I do, but the reality of this is the one lesson that I learned um, when I was at the State Department, and I think it's a lesson for all of us, is um, uh, programs that have a, um, a direct uh, numerical and ability to track results are the most effective for our foreign policy. One thing I learned quickly is these countries do not just want aid. In fact, they're embarrassed in many cases to accept actual aid. And programs such as uh, PEPFAR, which Tony and, and the Bush administration were at the forefront of it, the idea that you had programs that were, were basically um, data-driven and effective, programs like the MCC, which in my view were not, in fact, direct aid programs. They were, in fact, real development programs that uh, my friend Dana Hyde runs, who worked with me at the State Department, those programs were real substantive programs where countries, when you came in and said, listen, we're going to do a pact with you. Uh, you do these five things and we'll do these five things. And it was basically market-based results. And those are things what countries accept and want. Um, Pakistan, we spent a lot of time, uh, hundreds of hours in the situation room talking about how we were going to deliver the aid that we promised the Pakistanis. And I had hundreds of conversations with the foreign minister and the finance minister and the prime minister saying, we don't, we don't want those checks. We want to figure out a way uh, to, to basically stand it on. Give us big, large, help us develop large energy projects that we then can take care of ourselves. The thing that we created was in, uh, the Pakistan Egyptian, or sorry, the Pakistan Investment Fund, which was a direct fund using private sector and government monies to help work on SMEs. The same thing with the Egypt Development, the Egypt uh, Enterprise Fund that we also created. Again, my point was, the lesson that I learned was the giving of checks, although obviously important, on, on civil society, on rule of law, on obviously programs that are feeding people and educating people are very important. But the, the country, the recipients want to have ways for them to develop themselves beyond the traditional aid. And I think the work you guys are doing, the work the State Department is doing, the work that Ra Shah did at, at uh, USAID have moving us slowly. <laughs> but more closely to market-based results that have real benefits to long-term, not only the way we as the United States think of our development dollars, but as the recipients of those dollars and how they appreciate and receive those monies. Absolutely. Tom Knight, thank That's you very right. much. <coughs> Tony Fratto, let's be honest about this. I know this might sound horrific to a lot of you in this room. Uh, the next president is not going to get elected because of their foreign policy stance or their development stance. Well, we don't. Sure, we're not sure about that. Well, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> true. I was joking. We can all hope. <laughs> yeah. um, so, in that case, Tony, um, where are the political constituencies going to come from that gather around the issue of development? How do we make it a vote winner? It's a great question. I, I do want to say though that that. Um, there, there are ways to, if not uh, get them elected by it, but at least put pressure in campaigns, and we should do that. I know one campaign is, uh, is uh, doing a lot of that and should keep it up, because that's the way to get it on the agenda of, uh, of presidents. And just uh, two things on that. One is that um, when, you, when you have presidential candidates making commitments uh, in, a, uh, in a campaign, they generally try to fulfill those commitments. As I know like a lot of people don't believe that. They believe politicians say things and then try to do the opposite when they get elected. It's not true. You go, we, we've looked at this uh, that, uh, issue by issue. They actually try to do the things that they campaign on. So get them to make those commitments uh, now if, uh, if you're in the advocacy business. The second thing is that, and it's a, one of the reasons why I love the fact that this, uh, this report is, um, uh, is branded as uh, entitled as the White House and the World. And it's not to diminish uh, all of the agencies who do uh, amazing work. And I'm a treasury guy, Ben's a treasury guy, Tom's a, a State Department guy. None of the um, accomplishments in, uh, in development, whether it's official or private sector, 
uh, happens without leadership from the White House. AGOA doesn't get done without a leadership uh, without leadership from the White House. PEPFAR, MCC, mm -hmm. Feed the Future, Power Africa, none of them get done unless the White House is fully committed to take them up and put political capital behind it, go fight for it, do initiatives, use the bully pulpit to, to get it done. So the White House and the President in particular are so important to whatever uh, we decide and they decide the, the, the focus of the development agenda ought to be that we have to focus on, uh, on the White House and give them the best ideas and guidance. Um, to your question though, it's not easy to get Americans and to get American voters um, uh, involved with these, uh, with these questions. I mean, there's, this is, a, this is a, a problem that America has had for a long time, separated by two big uh, oceans, uh, keeps us separated from a lot of the problems of the world and we tend not to not to focus on on the rest of the world, that we have to think of that as a solvable problem. And uh, I remember um, I remember being at a dinner with uh, with Lindsey Graham once, having this the same conversation about how do we get people uh, engaged. And somebody said, "Well, should we make the national security argument?" I said, yeah, yeah, definitely make the national security argument. How about the China argument? Should we make the China argument? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely make the China argument. How about, uh, you know, uh, evangelicals and Christians are really involved in, in what do you, so, yeah, definitely, go talk to evangelicals and Christians too. Uh, what about just, uh, you know, the self-interest argument, the economic argument that we, you know, these countries develop and we can trade with them. What about that argument? Yeah, yeah, go make that argument too. The point is there's no one argument you can make to try to, to generate uh, the, the involvement and interest in consti uh, constituencies here in the United States um, you have to make all of them and look for them, and um, and I think that there are opportunities. There are opportunities to do that. One one last uh, one last point on this um, is that I do believe at the end of the day, and when we would go up to the hill and talk to appropriators and talk to members about supporting um, a lot of our programs, is that I do believe that Americans are um, actually generally generous and want to be generous and want to help and want to find ways uh, to, uh, to help. What, what didn't help uh, were, was the, the belief, sometimes accurate and sometimes erroneously, that, um, that our efforts on the international, uh, in international development weren't effective. Sometimes they weren't effective, sometimes they were effective, and I think they have become increasingly more effective. Effectiveness matters, and, um, and if you can show it, if you can measure it, um, then, uh, and you could show that money isn't being wasted, that the effort isn't being wasted. I think uh, Americans will tend to want to be more generous than not, and uh, and that's that's what I'd like to see a lot more energy to. Tony Fratto, a bit of shameless name dropping there, but I thank you for it. Um, <laughs> Michael Elliott, uh, Tony Fratto was talking about how Americans want to help. That brings to mind the moral imperative of development. The One Campaign has been at the forefront of that, trying to focus successive administrations, agendas and minds on development by making the moral case. We've heard the economic, the national security, the foreign policy case. Why don't you lay out for us, why should the average American voter in 2016 care about development? Well, thank you, Rajesh. And as you, as you said earlier, uh, we were in uh, Ethiopia together last week. In fact, I, I flew in this morning from Johannesburg on the, the brutal... Johannesburg, Dhaka, Washington Wait. run. So <laughs> if I talk more <laughs> gibberish than usual in five minutes' time, it's because I'm still slightly spacey. <coughs> um, picking up, in answer to your question, uh, Rajesh, the points uh, that, uh, that Tony made, uh, we will make any argument at the One Campaign for, uh, for support, political support for programs uh, that save and improve lives. We'll make the economic argument, we'll make the business argument, we'll make the foreign policy argument, we'll make the protecting it forward argument that Larry made uh, in the video. We'll make them all. Uh, but I do actually believe, and it, it picks up Tony's last point, I do actually believe uh, that at its core, the success of uh, the effort to get bipartisan broad support uh, for life-saving programs over the last 20 years does actually lie in the fact that Americans believe it's the right thing to do. Uh, they believe that there is a, a case uh, that those of us uh, who, who, who came out ahead in the lottery of life uh, should um, do what we can uh, to help those who, who cannot. What was it that, uh, that your former boss 
President Bush used to say to those who what's what's the phrase uh, he always used to use? To those who are given much is given given much is given much is sort of misquote in the Bible, yeah. but yeah, yeah. it's effective um, though. Still, yeah. Sorry. so my uh, my uh, <laughs> uh, my boss, uh, the co-founder of Juan Bono, though he'd kill me if he if he heard me describe him as that. He likes to say uh, when he's when he's talking to an audience of scientists and and healthcare professionals and, and people who kind of really, you know, do the drug development and so on. He likes to say, you know, we started off our campaign talking about AIDS, talking about HIV AIDS at, uh, at the time of PEPFAR when, uh, when uh, you and others were working on it, Tony. Uh, and, you know, you could kind of look at, at AIDS drugs and you could say, is that such a really great ROI? I mean, really? I mean, they were quite expensive. And how many lives are they saving? And he said, but we didn't do it because of that. We did it because it was a question of justice. That in Washington, D.C., you could go to the CVS and you could get a few pills that were going to save your life. And if you were in Malawi or Ghana or Kenya, you couldn't. And the only reason that you couldn't was an accident of geography. That's it. No other reason. So at, at its heart, the appeal to justice is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly powerful. There's stuff that we can do. It's a rich world. We have incredible resources. There's stuff that we can do, and there's stuff that we have done. You know, we have had an extraordinary impact in the last 15 years, uh, not just in kind of reducing global poverty, but in really attacking some killer diseases like HIV, AIDS, malaria, and others. We've driven down deaths of, uh, of those before their fifth birthday in half in the last 15 years, we can kind of drive it down again. Uh, so it's an extraordinary thing that one has been able to do. And there are wonderful reasons of politics and economics and business and opportunity uh, to do it. But at its heart, uh, I think that people understand that the reason that we do this is a reason of justice. Now, let me just kind of say one thing. I think the United States has been an incredible leader in this, uh, in this enterprise in the last 15 years. And, and astonishingly, uh, in a city where, you know, Republicans and Democrats can't agree on what day comes after July the 4th, you know, they've done it in a, in a way that shows genuine bipartisan spirit. But I think as we move to the next stage of thinking about development, you know, and think of a lot of the issues that Nancy and you and Todd and others here I've been writing about that in terms of global pu public goods as we think about climate change, as we think about migration policy, as we think about tax policy, very much on the agenda at ADIS at the Finance for Development conference uh, last week, as we think of peace and security, and we think of their impact on global development, it is going to be tougher, I think, to maintain the wonderful bipartisan spirit that has seen us through these last extraordinary 15 years. So maybe that's something that we can mm. pick up later on. We certainly will. OK, Michael Elliott, thank you very much indeed. Tony, you just got upped in your name dropping by yes, Michael Elliott. Yes, very impressive. It's, it's a benefit Bono of Bono there. <laughs> yeah. um, OK, so we've talked about the why for robust US development policies. Let's put a little meat on that. Let's talk about the what. A lot of it is included in this publication here, Michael just hinted at it. It talked about politics, the economics, the business, the justice motivi motiv motivations. Many of the papers in here draw on all of those and give practical recommendations for what the next administration could do. Uh, let's get some examples uh, from this. Let's, let's call on Tom and Tony here. You've been keen observers, active participants in shaping US development policy for the better part of the last two decades. Can you share with us examples of where you think US development efforts have achieved real progress during that time. Tom, you just give, you did give us a couple of examples earlier. I'm wondering if there are others you can think of, and the same to you, Tony. Well, when I was just talking to Hillary Clinton on the way here, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to fit in, okay? I was just trying you to win. I was just trying to fit in. Hold on, let me, um, let me just text her and see if that's true. You know. Just trying to fit in. Um, I, um, listen, I, I think they're his, and I think this is what these guys have said, which I think is imperative. Where we've been successful as um, uh, from the State Department and USAID is when we're able to formulate bipartisan solutions. I mean, aid has been 
And I give, and I really to honestly give, I give President Bush an enormous amount of credit for this. Um, I think we've, we are grabbing onto the model with uh, Feed the Future, uh, Power Africa, some of the, really some of the activities that I think Raj was uh, doing at USAID on really technology build and trying to invest in schools for new technology and try to get new innovation going. Um, so I think where, where we have been successful as a, um, at least for the Democrats, is in many ways continuing on some of the things that they did on PEPFAR. We could have easily drifted from PEPFAR. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on to spend some of the money that PEPFAR had to use other programs. I think the MCC program, which I think is something I know Secretary Clinton embraced and I know John Kerry continues to embrace, are market-based approaches. So I think where we have been successful is when we think about development, not as a Democratic issue or a Republican issue, but as the, a foreign policy issue. And I think when we can convince people that one of the ways to avoid these constant conflicts that we find ourselves in is trying to really to build civil society in a way that's effective. And the way you build civil society is giving people hope. And when countries, you know, it doesn't, I spent an enormous amount of time in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq, uh, the people there are no different than the people in many places around the world. When there is no hope and there is no opportunity and there is no rule of law, guess what happens? Conflict happens. And I'm not saying it's a cure-all to be-all, but the reality is the one thing both Democrats and Republicans can agree on, they may squabble about how much money we spend on it, but can agree on that the investment in, the, in, in, in up front, as they say, paying forward, has enormous economic value for the country. I'm not saying that we could have done more in some of the places we've had conflicts over the last few years, but there's no question that it's something that we have, are convinced of, at least from a, from a policy perspective, that we can benefit. So my takeaway is, what we've been successful in the last 10 years, the last 20 years, is when we work together across political parties, and I give I give you know, organizations like one enormous, they're not a Democrat or a, liberal or a Republican organization. I agree with Tony about the religious community. I spent a lot of time uh, with Senator Graham, and, and he, you know, he's the kind of person you want on your side, not necessarily being president, but, but being <laughs> on your side uh, in this. There was no one I would go to quicker than, yeah. than to, and to, to Senator Graham who understood the issues, understand the importance, and the religious community was very important in developing that core argument. So, Bipartisanship, metrics, uh, but more importantly, focus on the things that work and not try to reinvent the wheel uh, with every administration. Keep the things that work really well, try to reinforce those, and also bring up your own ideas as the next administration. You talked about MCC and PEPFAR. Tab I, MCC, Tab J, PEPFAR, all included in the book. Tony, okay. same question to you, if you wouldn't mind. I like that, uh, obviously, and obviously, and I, I was, it's always nice to hear um, you know, praise for the programs that, that, that we worked on. Um, and I, and uh, you know, and obviously, uh, uh, some some things preceded uh, Bush administration. A GOA preceded the Bush administration. Um, the durability of it, though, I think, is is uh, is really impressive, and the bipartisan support for it. And we, you know, sought to expand it. Uh, we're proud of the bipartisan support for PEPFAR and Malaria in Initiative and MCC and some of the other, you know, debt cancellation. Obviously, we're pr we're proud of that. We're proud of the durability of it. What I'm most proud of, though. Is um, is the uh, the willingness to look at them uh, in in, uh, in evolutionary ways? I never got upset when I would hear that uh, the Obama administration is looking at ways to evolve PEPFAR or to evolve um, AGOA or to evolve uh, any of the other programs they're working on because they sh that's what should happen. Um, you know the way these the way these programs work, and so I, I actually think some uh, you know the the ability to uh, when, when you set the, we create these programs. And you have a principle, and you have uh, a concept of uh, you know measurable results, um, you know measurable outcomes. Then um, you can you can set it on its way, and if you stick with those principles and look for ways to keep them uh, modern and appropriate and working in the right context, um, uh, other administrations should should evolve them, and the next administration is going to evolve you know power Africa and uh, and feed the future. Feed the future, of course, is a uh, is, an, is a really, really important uh, evolution in, uh, in the way we think about uh, food that, uh, that spans decades, right? Decades of no real evolution. It was, yeah. long, it was a long time coming. So um, that's gonna, they're gonna have to continue to, uh, to evolve that way. But you asked the question of like, what is, what is um, you know, most 
uh, most effective. And I actually think as effective and as proud as I am of all of these, all of these programs, I actually think what, what we're seeing today is a uh, much greater impact from what our private sector is doing without an interest even in development. I mean, the, the, the availability of, um, of technology today and ideas today and the ability to uh, socialize ideas and, and, and spread knowledge, um, it's just, you know, just obviously unsurpassed in the history of the, of the planet and I think is actually having the most impact on the ground in, uh, in so many countries right now. And um, so, and what I would love to see actually is a little bit more attention from our, our, our companies that are uh, creating that talent and, um, and using it and thinking on, on their part on how uh, they can maximize the development benefit from, uh, from the things that are developed. Some of them are, you know, obviously Google uh, thinks about it a lot, but not every um, uh, every big technology firm is doing that. I'd love to see a little bit more of that. Okay, Tony, you actually sort of uh, led me to my next question, which is, uh, you know, we've talked about the, 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 the changing environment of development, uh, that remittances dwarf aid, that there is growing demand for development finance, private sector involvement, uh, private sector investment in developing countries. Uh, and you talked a little bit about there, about harnessing technology, perhaps. I'm wondering what you panel, all of you, any of you, think of as the challenges, the greatest challenges that the U.S. faces uh, to keep up with these trends in development. Can I just answer one quick, I'll answer quickly before jumping to these guys. The problem is getting the Congress to do things differently. Mm. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but when we try to convince them to invest in enterprise funds, we did enterprise funds um, in, right after the Cold War, and some were quite successful, some weren't. Um, but to try to convince them to think out of the box, because you have to go to the appropriators, you have to go to the authorizers, you have to do all the, you know, to get things done. And uh, the reality is, when you have one way of doing things, the constraints on, on the administration and the development agency to do things differently is very difficult. And I, again, it's not, just the, it's not just the Congress, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but getting people to think differently, development needs to be thought in a different way and it, this is, we're now in the 21st century. We can't we have to do development in the 21st century. We're not in a 20th century way, and that's a big impediment on getting things done. Yeah. Okay, I know Ben wants to jump in, but very, I mean, don't think of it as disrupt, disrespectful. Think of it as disruptive. That's mm, what we like here at CGD. Yeah, you talked about the disruptive. problem of getting Congress to agree. Give me a solution. How do we get them to agree on these issues? What, what, what can you come up with? Well, let these guys, I don't want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 mean, it's, it's, I mean, listen, let's be clear. I, I, it, is, it is not so much... It is, you need to educate with, what, what people want is what these guys do, um, which is give, show real, tangible, numerical targets. I used to say you are what you track. If you can't track it, don't come into my office, okay? If you can't show results, one of the benefits of PEPFAR was, was they could show the increase, the use of, of what they were doing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, HIV and the providing of the drugs and the cost of drugs coming down in a way was tangible for members of Congress to understand it. It's up to, it's up to the executive branch and, and those who have been involved in the development to be very tangible and act and think like, not always think like business people, but think about this in very clear statistical numerical targets which they will then react to. And, and yeah. actually, and, and not just even those, uh, those inputs, right, but counting actual lives totally. saved, saved, right? That's, I mean, but by you know, one by one, you can count the number of uh, actual lives saved. Um, and that's, that's just really, really powerful. And Leah? I, I, yeah, I'd pick, go ahead, Tony, and then I'll one, come in one last thing on that. The, 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 I don't want to rule out that, the, or, or disregard that sort of self-interest kind of stuff too, right? There's, there is a lot of self-interest in, in some of these programs, and, and a lot of it is exhibited on the Hill, and we see that, we, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the, um, our, our, our contributions to, you know, uh, global food and nutrition, uh, right? I mean, that's about as durable as you can, possibly get because it is a supremely powerful political coalition invested in that uh, in that program and it includes you know uh, urban members and uh, you know farm country or uh, rural uh, members of Congress and it now it, it's it's really durable but it's invested in the way we do, we do food today and um, and it is self-interested yeah. but you try to go try to re, you know, try to reform, reform it, it and you have to ask yourself, do you want to reform it and and break apart that you know really durable coalition of support for
for the program, and that's a that, that's, that, that's an open question. And Leah, I'd pick up on a couple of the previous comments, and in particular, uh, Tony's comment about the evolutionary approach to development by successive administrations. I think one of the key opportunities for whoever comes next is to focus on development finance. You talked about development finance. So there's an overriding desire for investment in these countries. Tom mentioned mm -hmm. that. And if you look at different developing regions, overwhelmingly people cite the economic opportunities as their most important concern. So it's almost 70% of people in Sub-Saharan Africa. What are our tools to actually promote that? Sometimes aid-based programs are able to to have a strong impact on that. Tony's talked a little bit about Feed the Future, which is basically about livelihoods. But oftentimes, the best tool is private sector, US investment, capital, and know-how. And in that context, I think there's a great opportunity for the next US president to be able to take some evolutionary approaches to what we have now. So Tom was talking about the enterprise funds and how difficult it is to get Congress to appropriate 50 or 100 million or several hundred million dollars. Well, right now, we have the Overseas Private Investment Corporation who's sitting on $11 billion of deployable capital but can't move it because they don't have the staff and the teams to actually do transactions. They're doing great work, but they're under-resourced. And so I think one of the big opportunities for the next president is in this particular issue, development finance which is harnessing America's strengths, building off of what we have currently, but is highly dispersed across a whole range of different US agencies. If you took OPEC as the cornerstone and brought in a series of other tools that are out there but are spread right now, you could have a massive impact. And at the same time, have it be budget neutral or budget positive, which I think you're talking about how do you sell it to Congress, you know, there may be other political challenges, but removing that one is very important. So I think that's, that's one that's an opportunity in terms of evolution that I think we'd like to see. I mean, okay, I, thanks, I, let, me just, let me just foot this off. The, the idea of creating a development bank, um, again, I, the, Elizabeth does a great job at OPEC and um, all of the people do a terrific job, but a, we, are, we are nowhere near where we need to be. One thing that we have in this country is the availability of capital and the ability of technology, and the combination of those are very important. And the reality is, I bet I spent almost two and a half years trying to get the Egyptian um, Enterprise Fund up. Uh, I got Jim Harmon, who was, as you know, a, a big time banker, but had run uh, the uh, XM Bank. I cajoled him into doing it. He says the most frustrating thing he's ever done, but he's gotten it done. Um, we are now, they are now using those monies to invest in, in SMEs and buy a bank use that as a, as a multiplier. You would have thought within the Egyptian government that we had just given them $5 billion, how excited they were about this enterprise fund. Again, it's market-based approach. It's, not, it's more assistance than aid, and it has enormous impact on the way we think about development. So a larger frame of a development bank that we could create that will use all the tools that we have is certainly an idea worthy of the next president to be focused on. Okay, Michael, a quick point on this, and then I want to ask you a question. Yeah, so I, I, l let me just kind of be a tiny little bit retro on, uh, <laughs> on, uh, on this point, because, I mean, there's nothing that anyone has said about the importance of uh, a private sector investment that I, that I don't agree with. I mean, it's obviously the case. It's obviously the case that FDI flows dwarf and will dwarf even more uh, over the next 10 or 15 years, uh, flows of, uh, of ODA, of, uh, of visual development assistance. But, 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 let us remember that for quite a while, a dollar of FDI does not equal a dollar of ODA, does not equal a dollar sure. of remittances. They have different imp impacts, they have different effects. And as we continue to drive down uh, the number in extreme poverty and the number who suffer from preventable death, we will be left with a call in the most fragile states, in the least developed countries, in West Africa, in the three Ebola countries and what have you, where aid is going to count for a significant period of time. So although I, you know, I, everything that, uh, that Tom said, uh, that Tony said uh, on, uh, on private sector stuff, I, you know, I kind of completely agree with. But you know, we do have to remember <coughs> that the case for traditional ODA, which we still have to make every year, and it's, you know, it, it's tough every year, is a case that is worth making, because in the toughest cases, it's still going to be really important. I think that's a really important point to make, just hammer home the point that for the poorest, the most vulnerable states and communities, aid is still very important. No one here is, not, is denying that. Uh, we, what CGD talks about a lot of is 
beyond aid policies. The idea that as more countries graduate from being, you know, in abject poverty, that what they need is investment yeah. and they need jobs and opportunity more than anything else. Let me ask you one more quick question, then we're going to open it up to the audience. Uh, I talked about beyond aid policies. The idea of a US Development and Finance Corporation is a beyond aid policy. It's a virtually no cost uh, tweaked policy to US policy that um, the government could make that would have massive implications for the developing world. Give me another example of a beyond aid policy you'd like to see the next administration implement. Well, I think there are a number. And I think the problem is, as I said at the B, uh, in, in my opening remarks, uh, is that none of them have a guarantee of having the same sort of bipartisan support as the traditional programs that we've done for the last 20 years have. Um, there are people who work with Michael Clemens, who works with CGD, would, uh, would say that a really hard look at migration policy, I mean, good God, you know, look at what's happening in the Mediterranean now, uh, is, uh, is something that we should factor into, into the development debate. Climate change, plainly we need to factor into the devel development debate, if only to make sure, let me get this on the record, that any funds that go into, uh, into mitigating and adapting climate change do not come at the expense of uh, funds which are there for traditional development programs. Um, uh, I, I, that has happened by last week. We ended up uh, talking a great, great length right at the end of the FFD program on taxation, on international taxation problems. Not because kind of stroppy little CSOs like us put it on the agenda, but because developing countries want to talk about global taxation. So there are a lot of beyond aid, uh, there are a lot of new development topics out there. Not all of them though, are as easy to find the broad political consensus in this town as we have been able to do with the health and the nutrition and the, and the extreme poverty program. That's why you're all here. To tell us how to do that, Ben. Good quick point. point, then we'll open it up. Um, yeah, well, the, there's, there's a couple of things on this. Um, first, uh, you know, I've, I've been focusing on investment, finance, and, and a range of other things. So you guys... Uh, got commented on for name dropping. I'll just, my job is to name drop the content in our, in our product. <laughs> uh, but I, so I should flag that there, there are a lot of ideas for how to make the existing aid-based programs even more effective and efficient. So there's, there's things on USAID, MCC, PEPFAR, Global Health more broadly, that would be smart tweaks that would likely have no incremental cost but lead to more effective outcomes. I would actually take exception to Mike on, on migration. That's one of the ones that I would actually flag. Absolutely is it incredibly charged. And the, the research shows that it is one of the most potent impacts, has a, is one of the most potent tools for promoting prosperity for significant portions of, pe of society. And there's opportunities for win-win arrangements uh, for example, a, um, a bilateral U.S.-Mexico agreement for temporary labor. I think there could be an opportunity for something like that. And if you're thinking of ROI, that's going to have a bigger impact than just about anything else that we talked about in terms of what's going to happen back at home. There's a couple of other ideas that are related to, to migration as well that I think should be part of the debate. It may be challenging to get there in the end, but in terms of the potential impact, it is definitely worthy of having that debate. Tab B in your books here <laughs> is about migration. Have a read of it, exactly what Ben was talking about. Panelists, thank you for the moment. We're going to get some questions from the audience. We have a couple of uh, colleagues here with microphones. I know there are a couple of people who indicated they wanted to ask a question already. Let's start with them and then open up more generally. Um, Ma'am, I think you in the front row, Dana? Yeah. Uh, the microphone's coming. Please stand up. Tell us who you are, where you're from and ask your question. I would ask you to make it a question as opposed to comments yes. on the previous speakers. <laughs> Absolutely, Thank thanks you. so much. Hi, uh, my name is Dana Dreider. I'm with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. My question has actually changed, uh, Ben, <laughs> throughout the course of this conversation, which was really helpful. I'm wondering, so I heard a lot, I was going to ask about, you know, what are the one or two things that you all would suggest the next administration not change? Because I suspect a lot of the conversation going forward, not just with this panel, but with many other discussions to come is going to be, you know, what's the hot new thing? What's the change agenda? Um, 
So, but I think I heard you talk about that in a very helpful way, the bipartisan, um, the results, et cetera. And I guess maybe, Ben, this question is mostly for you or anybody who wants to address the development finance piece, because I hear you that the beyond aid policies are really important, but I'm wondering how do you square that if you give that as a proposal to an incoming White House, knowing that they have stakeholders on the Hill um, and with NGOs, with all kinds of other stakeholders who are very used to and interested in measurable results. Things about talking about saving lives, how many lives saved. How do you kind of square the two and, and make something like a development finance bank uh, easily sellable, for lack of a better word? So Thanks. I would focus on a couple of things. I think um, first is how the, the world has changed. So that's why I actually started in at the very beginning in terms of uh, what people's most pressing priorities are what the gaps are, all these kinds of things. So if you think of a vehicle or a program that is the most relevant for our developing country partners, it is about attracting investment and helping these countries create jobs. Is that a little bit more challenging for domestic political constituencies here? Perhaps. Uh, it's definitely different. So I think the key that I would stress is it's not like we, we, the next administration should jettison all these effective, more traditional programs up until now. No, they should continue them and they should make additional evolutionary tweaks to make them even more effective. But in this case, it's more about where are the gaps in, within our tools right now which matter tremendously. And if you think about metrics, Development finance institutions are actually collecting a lot of information. I've actually looked at, at what OPIC does on a regular basis, and, and it's quite comprehensive. It's just different metrics. How many jobs are going to be directly created by an investment? What are going to be the tax payments that go into a, a, recipient or a, a developing country government that are going to finance a whole range of different things? What are the technology transfers? What are the demonstration effects? You can add additional metrics that could flesh some of that out, um, but it's, it's a different set of metrics versus live saved. It's more about a set of metrics focused on prosperity and opportunity and the ability to be able to make a contribution to broader families and communities as well that will come back to benefits for U.S. commercial entities as well. So I would, I would just frame it differently. But I mean, we have to be, we, to your point, we have to be careful here too as much as I'm an advocate of market-based solutions, because we do have a level, remember, the, I used to say con, con, continually, you know, 1% of the federal budget is spent from state and USAID. I mean, it's an insanely small amount. I mean, the UK is light years ahead of us, in my view, of what they're, how they think about uh, development and how much they spend on aid and development banks and all the issues around that. And I've uh, admired greatly what they've been able to pull off even through unbelievably difficult budget constraints. So the reality is we have to be careful that people don't grab onto this as some idea that they can cut back on this traditional aid right. to your point, which is because that those people will never be affected by a development bank. Um, you know, there are, there are monies that we need to give directly for food and for shelter and education and for health that they'll never receive through a, as good a development bank as we could create. It's all the investments we do in SMEs it could be tens, it could be years and years before that actually trickles down the, the neediest of those individuals. So we have to be careful, but I t completely agree. We have the resources in this country. Part of it is just getting them together. Part of it is trying to bring all of the disparate, in, disparate organizations together in a where it concrete, what the UK has done in many cases and how they actually funnel much of their attention. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's, it's I think, a little bit better than what we've tried to do, what we've done here, and I think we can learn a lesson from that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get another question from the audience uh, down here. Just wait for the microphone, stand up, introduce yourself, and then ask away. And again, I would encourage you to keep it a question. I will do that, even though most of my questions have already been answered somewhat, <laughs> so I have to do this on the fly. Uh, Michael Miller from the Kyle House Group. I also help run a group called the Consensus for Development Reform, which is a, most, which is a Republican group that focuses on building uh, through reform with the, with, with the idea that reformed and better performing foreign assistance will better serve our purposes and better serve those that we helped. Um, my question is about, what the, one of the first uh, facts we heard was that aid is not development. One of the second facts we heard was that uh, 
the 150 count or direct foreign assistance is a declining portion of overall development finance. I would add a couple of other facts to that and then pose the question. One is we're seeing fewer and fewer countries will, will qualify, if you will, for, for the kind of aid we were discussing largely, which is a good news story, but also that humanita or humanitarian aid, things like PEPFAR and the President's Millennium Initiative and stuff like that, they're sort of an exception in that these humanitarian interventions do not uh, they, they, they are not guided by political considerations necessarily. They are focused in many cases on countries that uh, oppose our interests in many other arenas. And if you look down the list of PEPFAR focused countries, it's not easy to, it's not hard to see, see where those are. So with all these facts, it seems like um, what is, for the policymaker, this prevents a real challenge. That, that what we can control and what the U.S. government does in terms of development is a smaller and smaller portion. So this challenge for policymakers is, uh, is our government structured and built to adapt to that? And if, if not, how should it change? Who would you like to put, put on the spot? Uh, that's for everybody. Okay. Tony, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's a, a couple of things on that. I mean, I, uh, well, first of all, I want to say, uh, and if it wasn't wasn't clear from uh, from the beginning, um, first of all, I actually do think that um, that aid is development is an important integral part of development. It's not the only part of it, and over time will uh, become I think inc increasingly less important. But we're a long way away yeah. from that. I mean, a long way. I mean, not only do I continue to support uh, aid development assistance, I, I think we actually still need to see increases mm -hmm. in. Uh, and development assistance in, in the near term. So I think it's critically important. Um, that said, you know, and, and, and age, you know, age, uh, development agencies, aid agencies in particular, you know, I mean, we'd love to see some of them ultimately, you know, think about how to put themselves out of business, right? That's the, that's the goal of any um, uh, agency is to, is to be successful to the point where you put your, put yourself out of business. So that's not a that's not a bad thing. I just think we're we're a long way from there. I mean, there's you know the long long lead times on some uh, some of these countries, um, but you know getting back to the, the 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 sense of sort of you know evolution of goals and tactics to achieve um, what we're you know what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I, I do think there is there's still a lot more that we can do to make. Um, you know, help countries become actually much more welcoming as they, you know, do their health and education goals and infrastructure goals to uh, make themselves much more open and welcoming to um, to private sector financing. I mean, I love the ideas of um, I love the ideas of a you know of, of uh, development banks and you know cash on on uh, on delivery and uh, all yeah. of those ideas. But still, ultimately, we want to create environments where countries uh, have access to. You know, global capital markets, where they're the most efficient allocators of capital, look at them uh, the right way. You know, years ago we did we did some work on thinking about you know trying to have countries get um, get rated by rating agencies, right? Just to get rated, so that they can you know have some benchmark uh, when they when they go into capital uh, into capital markets. We were probably maybe we were too early on that, but we should still keep working on that and see you know, have countries continue to try to you know work on how they can get. Uh, on how they can get rated. Um, we also have some storytelling to do too and convincing uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, multinational companies in particular to go into these um, economies. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the biggest problem we have is not that the United States government isn't engaged in Africa, for example, it's that US corporations aren't Absolutely. engaged in Africa. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's shocking. I mean, that the, the, the you know we see you see French and certainly Chinese. a lot of Chinese, you know, Korean and other countries, German uh, German uh, companies going into uh, Africa, and for a lot of different reasons, and it's complex, uh, but of a lot of different reasons, a lot of U.S. companies don't go in. They need to go in, and so when about a year and a half ago, uh, uh, GE said, you know, Jeff Inalt said that you know they're going to be doing about six billion dollars worth of business in. In Africa and going up from there, you know, it was like, er, you know, everybody stopped and looked and said, "Wow, like, did we are we missing Africa now?" Because I mean, if GE 
is in there at that, um, at that scale, we better go take another look at it. And I think so we need to encourage more companies to go in and do that and just get in there, take some risk, work with countries, help them understand what a, an inviting um, environment is. Uh, sorry, last, last uh, point on this. Uh, at Treasury, we, we, we tried to do uh, a lot of this kind of work too. We did a lot of technical assistance in these countries. It's probably the, like the least known uh, program in all of the federal government is, uh, is, is you know, technical assistance for countries on fiscal and, and other matters, helping them do but a budget. But it sounds budget. so sexy. How could it be least? It's a, it's, least but it's, 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 it's really amazing because cool. it's like really talented people around, yeah. the, around the world that, we, that countries pay for, right, to, to go in and help them do, you know, fiscal budgeting. And reporting economic data and interagency uh, operations, and it's hugely important for how these countries can uh, can operate. And again, to be inviting for uh, private capital to go in. Okay, I want to just open it up to some questions. The hands have shot up into the air. Let me gather a few questions. Let's start over on this side as these hands up went f went up first, and then come around to this side. You, sir, uh, if you could just stand up, tell us who where you are from, give us your name, and I would encourage you. Make it a question, brief, to the point. We are uh, tight on time. Mike Davis, uh, Universal Human Rights Network here. I'd like to hear the panelists uh, address the role of uh, human rights uh, in development and financing development. Thank you. Okay, let me take a couple more questions actually before we answer that. Gentleman behind you, then we'll go to you, sir. Hello, um, my name is Miguel Euse from CSIS. I guess my question is, how do we sell ideas that don't have short-term results and that the metrics are not that clear, we haven't talked almost at all about governance, institutional programs, cultural change, so it's a little bit trickier to sell these kind of ideas. Okay, and then this gentleman over here, then we'll get some answers to these questions. <coughs> My name is Neil Belson, and I was president of New Agriculture Incorporated, a Maryland company that developed technologies for, uh, bio, con um, for bioprocessing, converting uh, plant materials into energy and chemicals until I sold the company last month. And my question is, with the uh, growing emphasis on uh, bio-based technologies, that is the production of fuels and also industrial chemicals from bio-based sources rather than petroleum sources, is there any opportunity for develop, I would think there is, and is there opportunity and how for developing countries to take advantage of these new technologies because they already have the most important raw material for capitalizing on these technologies, which is land. OK, three questions there. Let me summarize briefly, panel. Uh, the first question was about the role of human rights. The second question, as I understood it, was how do you basically stop uh, results being short term uh, through better governance? And then the last question was, are there opportunities for developing countries to use technologies uh, based on biofuels uh, given that they have a lot of land. So who'd like to kick off? Tony, pick a question. Uh, sure, I'll take, uh, just a, 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 first of all, yes, human rights are just critically uh, important. We can't not, in US government, I don't think we'll ever, uh, you know, stop, you know, uh, speaking out on, on human rights issues. It's, 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 it's we, we do it. We're the loudest and most persistent on those, on those issues. And I think we have, to, we have to keep that up. And I think they go together. Uh, I, think they're, I think it's integral to development. On short-termism, um, it's a real problem, right? In fact, it's a bigger problem, um, <laughs> um, ironically, uh, with more democracy, right? <laughs> because if you're going to have uh, you know open uh, open elections, uh, then people become you know, politicians. This is you know just live with this, right? They have to go out and and uh, and um, uh, get get people to vote for them. So if you say we're going to do um, you know you're going to see the results on education, that's going to take 12 years. Right, that's really tough. Um, so you do have to do some measuring of uh, and, and accounting for inputs in those situations also, because you know, and find ways to, that people can see results on things like that. Even if the ultimate results, the outcomes that we want to measure and count for, can they read? Can they compute uh, at a high level? You're 12 or 15 years away from from accomplishing that. If you're going to do a mega project on on uh, power and water, right? You're talking 10 or 15 years before you see real results from inception to um, you know, rate paying customers getting water. So you know, until you get some interim, so you need, you need to think about some interim solutions along, uh, along the way. It's, you know, it, it's, it's tricky, but you just, have to, you just have to account for it. 
No, I <coughs> very much agree with that. I, you know, sort of prior life, uh, I was in the cabinet office in, uh, in, the, uh, in the British um, government uh, as, a, as a policy one. Can I remember vividly, shortly before uh, a general election, uh, uh, a minister saying, those policies that we did to increase the, uh, the, uh, the employment opportunities of school leavers, when exactly are they going to take effect? <laughs> About 25 years. I said, can you speed it up? <laughs> not really, you know, not really. Uh, <coughs> so, so, uh, so no, I mean, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. I, I, I really wanted to say something about the point on governance because I think that is, that is going to be an increasingly critical part of the debate uh, that we have on development for the next 10 years. Because I think we, you know, we, are, we are learning, or I was going to say every day, that's an exaggeration, every month, every year, that the inputs that we make, whether to fund health programs or nutrition programs or anti-poverty programs or infrastructure indeed, whatever it is, uh, critically, deter critically depend in terms of, of desirable outputs at the end uh, on the quality of governance uh, that one sees. And, uh, and I think anything, uh, the, 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 there's already a debate about how that can be nudged along. And the key part of the debate that we can concentrate on right now is what we in the global north can do to improve governance in the global south. And one thing that we can do is make corruption less easy. You know, so don't, you know, all those kind of lawyers in, uh, in, uh, in London and New York who kind of write kind of tax dodging schemes. I mean, guys, haven't you got anything better to do with your degree from Oxford or Yale than, you know, than just kind of do that? Uh, but all the, all, the, all, the, all the stuff that we can do in the global north to make sure that capital flight is reduced, to make sure that illicit, illicit capital flows are, are, uh, are diminished. Frank Vogel is here. One of the founders of Transparency International knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, that's not where the governance debate should end, because there's lots and lots of issues of the governance debate that we really need to get into in the global south as well. But at the very least, we can think of those things that we can do in the global north to make sure the governance is improved. Okay, panel, I'm just going to invite two more questions from the audience. We are running a little bit long, and then uh, I'll ask you to give 30 seconds worth of closing remarks. Lady over there. and. Frank Vogel, over there. Let's go to the. Um, so, since this is all about the White House and the world, if you world, could start by just introducing oh, yes. yourself, please. My name is Rachel Bailey. I'm with the U.S. Treasury Department, the International Affairs. Um, so, I was wondering if any of you cared to talk at all about the potential candidates for the White House, <laughs> and if there are <laughs> important differences you might observe amongst them all. Uh, yes, I'm going to intervene today. here to spare their blushes and say we are going to be having a reception, so maybe you could have that conversation with the candidate, with <laughs> the panelists. No, I'm more than happy to have the conversation. You want to have that <laughs> You want to make that well, point? You just, you just talked to her on the way in. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to say perhaps have that conversation over a drink <laughs> later on. Uh, Frank. Here. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Frank Bowling. Transparency International. Um, Thank you for, for that plug, and you're totally right, of course, uh, about corruption. Security. You yeah, mentioned it good. right at the introduction, but then, as far as I can see, there isn't that much. Yeah. Uh, question. If you're going to get development really on the agenda in this election, isn't it high time that security policies and development policies were looked at yeah. at one and the same time instead of separated out? Yeah. And what is your recommendation uh, for doing that? We certainly see massive corruption in security aid programs, uh, which is why they're undermining development. So that's just one suggestion. Mm. Uh, I'm going to suggest that afterwards, when you're having a drink, you talk to Nazni Nash over there, who's written about foreign policy for White House and the world. And I'm going to invite Ben to answer this question. So you beat me to it. I was actually going to highlight uh, a forthcoming paper. It's not in this particular briefing book right now, but it is going to be in the next wave. So this is going to be a living project for us. There's going to be at least several more coming in. And what Nazanin does is look at exactly your question in terms of the nexus of development and security objectives and investments, and is there a better, more strategic way that would deliver greater U.S. outcomes. And so she has two or three ideas in there about how we could do a better job specifically in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, which is she has a lot of experience on as a policymaker in the past. So I would definitely uh, seek her out afterwards and then look for the paper. <laughs> Uh, as, it, as it becomes available in a couple of weeks. If I could, 
um, uh, just do a couple more plugs uh, and continue my in my role on this is Michael made some very good comments uh, and uh, re observations about transparency, economic transparency. One of our colleagues, Owen Barter, has a brief in here about some very specific ideas that a number of folks have been working on for, for some time and would actually have a, a very big impact. Some of Owen's work is new. He's worked on transparency for years and years. Uh, so there's some great ideas in there in terms of greater transparency financial, for financial flows. Last thing I would say, Raj I know Rajesh wants me to wrap it up, on the short-term outcomes or short-term metrics, I think one of the key things is something that Tony mentioned earlier, which is cash on delivery. So mm -hmm. I think back to so what some of my colleagues in, the, in, uh, when, in um, the Bush administration did with Africa Education Initiative, which there were such strong concerns about um, and Don, actually, I see in the, in, the, in the audience probably worked on this when he was at the NSC, is there was such strong concerns about corruption that it led the program and USAID to focus on textbooks, teacher training, and girl scholarships. All very good things, but they were inputs. They weren't directly tied to educational outcomes. If you shift towards cash on delivery where the overarching objective of the relationship or any kind of program partnership is focused on educational outcomes, then that allows you to completely change the structure of the entire program. And you're still going to have that intertemporal challenge, but it does push back and mitigate against the natural inclination to move towards very demonstrable short-term input mm. metrics. Uh, if you shifted more towards cash on delivery and those kinds of programs, I think it would be completely a game changer. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are running a little bit long, but it's so interesting. I didn't want to interrupt them. But I think, gentlemen, at this stage, I'm going to ask you just for 30 seconds, 30 seconds of closing thoughts. Uh, Tom Nides, um, on what you've heard, um, give us a tip on how to sell development <laughs> as a foreign policy and a business tool on the campaign trail. Well, let me let me not answer that question. I mean, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but let me just. But, but How did I know that was the, coming? The, the, <laughs> one, the one thing that we we did not really talk about very much, we really need to, as we think about development of the 21st century, is the legislative branch. Okay, because I think w one of the concerns, as someone who was a practitioner who dealt with these massive budgets and these massive pipelines of assistance, the appropriations and the authorizing system is basically broken vis-a-vis -vis assistance. And, and when you are, you know, I can, my team would sit here and, and we would joke about this, but we'd have multiple years of money basically stacking up because we had the inability to spend the money because of the constraints that were put on us by the Hill. All well-intentioned, but what that causes is this massive constipation vis-a-vis -vis how development dollars are spent. And then what that creates is this very much a risk adverse um, tendency within policymakers because there's no advantage of getting it wrong, right? So what ultimately what happens is you're doing development in really complicated places. And guess what? You're going to make mistakes. And guess what? There's going to be corruption. I hate to say it, but when you're giving away billions of dollars in Afghanistan, there is going to be some corruption. And ultimately what ends up happening is when you're going back to trying to assist people in places that need these dollars, you're talking about, in most cases, very unsophisticated um, countries and rule of law, which is a problem. So one of the problems that we need to do is we need to, as you're talking about these policy changes for the White House, we cannot let the legislative branch off the hook. And we have to continually try to examine what's wrong with the appropriations process, what we can do better on the authorizing process, how we can make sure these programs have justifiably understandable notions that we don't create this, this, this kind of inability to do any kind of uh, risk assessment within the, within the development. Because when that happens is you basically get really terrible results. You do the minimal amount of work. You, do, you don't get to the, the neediest of the people who need the money because you're fearing that those monies will be lost. So I, as much as I'd like to be able to go around the campaign trail, listen, ultimately development itself will not be uh, the number one campaign issue. But when you can, can, I think the American people are in fact compassionate. And I do think people understand the development does equal security. And when you can make the argument, as multiple presidents have said, I used to joke about when you know, I spent time in Afghanistan and Petraeus would say, listen, uh, you know, I'm gonna clear it, you gotta hold it, okay? You know, holding it means 
you know, spending the money on rule of law, spending the money on assistance programs, doing the things you need to do. So there's a connectivity between security and development. American people need to understand that. You can talk about it. This election won't be decided on it, obviously. But we cannot, we cannot walk away from it because it's important for our country and for the next president. Okay, thank you. I'm sure no one here is going to be walking away from that. Michael Elliott, though, how do you turn that the idea that everyone wants to be thought of as good, how do you square that with political self-interest and turn it into votes for development policy? 30 seconds, please. Uh, <laughs> oh, that easy. Um, look, I think uh, that all the evidence shows that when you make, I mean, it really does, I mean, I'm not just saying this, that when you make of the importance of supporting these programs, when you spell the facts out, when you explain, as Tom says, that it's 1% of, uh, of, uh, of the US budget going to everything, going to the whole of, uh, of, uh, of the 150 account, never mind uh, just kind of siphoning it into the aid program, not 18%, which is what people say. Uh, when you explain what it does, when you explain the lives that it saves, when you explain the way that it pays forward to protect our, uh, our security, when, uh, when you explain the way that it creates economic opportunities, people get it. People get it, you know, I mean, it's not true. It's not true that you can, uh, what was that line, you know, that nobody ever went out of business by underestimating the sophistication of the American public? Not true. Fundamentally not true. Fundamentally not true. You explain this stuff, people get it. Okay. Tony Fratto, with your communications hat on, please. How do you communicate this stuff? What's the storytelling here? What are the messages on the campaign trail that are going to make candidates feel easy about talking about development? Uh, so no question what, what Michael just said is, is absolutely true in talking about, uh, talking about actual results and actual good that, um, that, that our programs are doing and, and presenting that to um, uh, especially the presidential candidates. I, I would just say this, I mean, there are like 19 guys running for president on the Republican uh, ticket and they've got this, um, this program for the uh, or, uh, the Republican primaries, and they with this program of like almost like relegation, you know, in, in like the English Premier League, right? You got to get like a certain amount of support in polls in order to get into the debates, you know. And if you don't keep that support, you get relegated to I don't know. Maybe they do debates on Bravo or something uh, if you don't get into the big <laughs> into the big debates, you know. So what I'm saying is like these guys are fighting over every last little bit of support that they can get. I mean, if you don't think like 1% different support uh, doesn't matter, you're wrong. Uh, so I would, I would appeal to their intellect as much as you can with data and good messaging. I would uh, appeal to their fears whether it's national security or China. Um, I would appeal to their, the better angels and on, on uh, you know, moral and ethical um, issues. Uh, they're you know, pragmatically that we can do it and maybe they're, you know, we, we should do it because we can do it and we can do it effectively and, and uh, some of that will accrue to us. And I would also just like get out there and get loud and bang on drums and make noise and make yourself known and seen and show up at, you know, there, 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 are, there, are, there are a hundred town hall meetings going on right now with some of these guys running around taking questions from people. Get up and ask them what their views are on these issues. Get there and ask them to make a commitment to uh, continue these, you know, the, 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 best of, uh, the best of these programs. Get up and ask them to think about innovative uh, uh, ways and um, you, can, you can do it. It's, it's, it's an open system, right? Get out, let's get out there and do it and, uh, and sort of force them to uh, to take positions. Okay, Ben, you and me, CGD Roadshow, we'll be out there. We'll be doing it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> finally. Uh, wrap up for us, Ben. What do you want people to take away from this book? Take it away, firstly. Yeah. What do you want them to take away from it? Yeah. I think there's a couple of, couple of key things. I think we've heard about why development matters and why it should be a part of the 2016 campaign cycle <laughs> and why this would be a strategic investment um, for whoever wins, him or her, uh, and, and once they come into office in 2017. I think the takeaway from the White House and the World Project is that there are over a dozen very practical proposals that we believe would have bipartisan appeal in the true spirit of Center for Global Development, which is a nonpartisan think tank. I think there's, there's very concrete tweaks or new ideas that could have a outsized impact uh, for U.S. policy objectives and global prosperity. 
So what we hope is that as you go away from here, take a look at, at some of these ideas. Let us know what you think. These aren't particularly, they, aren't, they don't have to be static. They will be evolutionary, as, as Tony mentioned before. And we're going to be talking with uh, a lot of these campaigns and, and people that are in influential positions around them. So any kind of feedback and further ideas will be extremely helpful. But this is something that we are very excited about. And what we hope is that a couple of years from now, we'll start to see some of these ideas manifest in actual policy and then start to deliver a meaningful impact on the ground over time. Thank you okay. all for coming. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, panel. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Please do take these books away from away with you. Have a look through them. Use them. They have tabs. You know how long it take it took some of our junior members of staff to make these tabs. Um, use them. They're designed to be practical. Contact us with any questions you have about them. Any thoughts? Our policy outreach team is here. They have name tags on as well. We'll be doing much more to make you all familiar with these ideas in the months to come. If you're watching on the webcast, check out the website. Uh, via the homepage, cgdev.org, you can get to the dedicated webpage of White House and the World. It has all the briefs, all the policy recommendations on it. It is live as of today. Uh, now, in the room, I invite you. We're going to open up. We're going to have some drinks, some food. We're going to be playing on these video screens. Also, some videos with some of the experts whose work is in this book explaining some of the detail of their particular ideas. And many of the authors are actually here with us today. Please do engage with them and with the panelists as well if you have further questions. But for me, Rajesh Merchandani, and on behalf of the panel, I thank you very much for joining us at CGD this afternoon. Have a good day.